forward march. We do not stop until the sun falls beneath the tree line. I am Sangrama, honored general of the Khmer Empire, tasked with quelling a rebellion. Just a year after the passing of the revered Suryavarman I, his successor faces staunch opposition. It threatens to dismantle the empire that Suryavarman took nearly five decades to build. Inspiring an army of largely levy soldiery is difficult. Most are simple farmers and craftsmen, strangers to the ways of war and the grim chaos of battle. They should understand the cause for which they fight. As we trudged through the mud, I summoned the captains to the front of the line. Knowing them personally, these men speak to the troops directly under their command in a different way than I ever could. I would tell them of the events that occurred before many of them were born. Surya Varman was once little more than a magnet with a minor claim to the throne held by another. Udayaditya Varman I had established a seat at Angkor, claiming the entire empire as his dominion. Gathering his army, Surya Varman marched on Angkor from the west, establishing a camp not far from the city. From this camp we will build up and strike at Angkor! Udaya Diriyavaman the first reign ends this day! Bat! Bat! No bomb rania! Batin! No bomb rania! Batin! Captains listened eagerly as I gave my account of the usurpation. Despite a numerical disadvantage, Surya Varman's tactical acumen proved critical to the success of such a risky offensive. Droves of Uyaditya Varman's troops fell to Surya Varman's disciplined infantry and elephant corps. Entering Angkor, Surya Varman gave the order to his disciplined army that the city was to be left intact, the civilians unharmed. He would not begin his rule by committing acts of savage tyranny upon his own people. A to power does not come easily. Once the hat of one beast is removed, three spring to take its place. Such was the case with Surya Varman's enemies. Rebel factions sprung up to the north, east, and south of Angkor, Legions of disgruntled soldiers marched on the city, threatening to topple Surya Varman just as quickly as he had ascended to power. The most dangerous rebel faction was led by Jayavir Varman, a warlord from Malaysia, with a distant claim to the throne. Advancing from the south at a rapid pace, he acquired much support from the local populace. Surya Varman had to act quickly. The rebel forces, were they to unite, would present quite a challenge to an army that had only recently emerged victorious from a growing campaign. There was precious little time to spare. The rebel scum threaten us from three directions. Strike them down quickly before they can pool their forces. Humans are interesting creatures. At times they display incredible brilliance, and yet at others they behave like obstinate fools. One can only wonder at the folly that caused the rebel factions to not coordinate their forces. A bundle of sticks is difficult to break, but individual twigs snap as if they were bits of straw. Surya Varman's victory assured that this lesson would not be forgotten. As the empire boomed, its neighbors became very. A growing tiger gorged itself on the prey that it deems most vulnerable. Some dreaded the looming war and prayed that their fears were unjustified. Others prepared for it. The kingdom of Tambralinga, a vassal of 
the great Srivijayan Thessalocracy felt particularly threatened. The empire was surrounded by hostile neighbors, and conflict was imminent. It seemed that the only thing left to question would be who would strike first. Suryavarman was wise enough to know that passivity would only lead to disaster. The various Burmese kingdoms to the west of the empire behaved with hostility, but a potential ally lay beyond. The Cholas, a powerful dynasty based in the south of the Indian subcontinent, had interests that aligned with those of the Khmer. Dispatching a diplomatically skilled envoy laden with gifts could be enough to convince Rajendra Chola that an alliance with Suryavarman would be to his liking. The road west is perilous. You may have your pick of as many of my troops as you can afford to pay with the gold that I have given you. Despite the hardships of the journey through hostile territory, the diplomatic convoy arrived in Chola lands largely intact. Rajendra Chola was pleased with the gifts that the envoy lavished upon him. Especially impressive was a grand chariot, a work fashioned by the finest craftsmen in Angkor. Generous offerings and well-chosen birds go a long way with a magnanimous ruler. A bargain was struck, and the envoy returned to Angkor, harbinger of present news. With the alliance made and the pieces on the board, conflict was inevitable. The Tambralingas themselves posed only a token threat, but they had the support of the immense naval empire of Srivijaya. The prowess of the Srivijayan navy was unmatched, but their coalition was at its tactical disadvantage. The Khmer forces threatened the enemy by land from the north and by sea from the east, while the Cholas struck out from the west. The enemy found themselves surrounded on all sides. Suryavarman sent word to the Chola force to establish a foothold on the Murray Peninsula. Taking the initiative, he ordered the outfitting of a massive navy to challenge the Srivijayans and Tambralingas for maritime supremacy. Everything hinged on the success of the Chola force that had landed on the mainland. If they could present a formidable enough threat and occupy the enemy land forces, Suryavarman would be able to wrest control of the water and launch a devastating amphibious invasion. If the Cholas were driven from their foothold, the Khmer would be forced to face down their opponents alone, a prospect with which Suryavarman would not be particularly excited. Our Chola allies have established a foothold on Tambralinga lands. It must be held at all costs. Chomjol. Chomningdov. Storms raged as wooden vessels rammed into each other, a deafening sound prefaced by the bristling of projectiles through the air. Thousands of men sank below the angry waves, never to rise again. A Chola land force fought bravery, holding to the rest, just as it seemed that they were consigned to defeat the hands of the Tambralinga Srivijaya force. Salvation arrived in the form of swarms of Khmer. Victory has a glorious taste. Over the course of a single conflict, the influence and power of the empire were raised to unprecedented levels. With the maritime rivals of the empire crushed, Suryavarman set his sights on the mainland. As the war with the Tambralinga-Srivijaya alliance had progressed, it had not escaped his attention that 
rivals closer to home had been plotting and wishing for his ruin. The rulers of the various Burmese and Cham kingdoms slunk around in the shadows like disgraced cravens, instead of recognizing the superiority of their larger neighbor, they deviously plotted its downfall and encouraged rebellion within it. This behavior was unacceptable. Suryavarman's enemies may have been too intimidated to face the Khmer juggernaut head-on, but Suryavarman had no such reservations. These provocations had provided an optimal casus belli. It was high time that the empire saw further expansion. The Mekong and Chow Friar rivers snaked through rich, fertile lands held by decadent, unstable kingdoms ripe for conquest. Triumph would add yet another achievement to Suryavarman's legendary military record. Bountiful lands surround us, ripe for the taking. We shall build an empire to last a thousand years. Hegemony is a wonderful thing. The power and prestige of the Khmer Empire reached new levels under Suryavarman I, and all prospered. Despite being known as a great conqueror, Suryavarman was not simply a militaristic aggressor. His reign was marked by vast improvements in the general infrastructure of the empire and an emphasis on religious toleration. He erected numerous palaces and temple complexes and ruled benevolently. His legacy lives through these structures, the pride of our citizens, and the strength of the Khmer Empire. This legacy is a cause worth defending. The city of Amun's image lives on within it. It is this notion of greatness that you must invoke to electrify the minds of the common soldiery. <laughs> 